All right, I think we're live now. All right, welcome everyone. Glad you are here with us. We are live from the Oasis. I am Mike Davis, one of the pastors at the Oasis in Southern California. So happy you are here with us. So let's pray before we get started, and then we will jump into what we're going to do today, and I'll introduce you to our special guests. So Father, we thank you so much for your spirit of truth who leads us and guides us into your truth, which makes us free. So Lord, as we study together today, may you lead us, may you guide us, may you bring us into freedom spiritually, mentally, and emotionally. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, everyone, I am so happy to be here with you today. And as you can see, as I said, we're going to be doing something a little bit different today than what we normally do. Normally, I come on here and I teach. And as I said, for the month of May, because May is Mental Health Month, what I wanted to do was to dedicate the entire month talking about uh, mental and emotional health and well-being. And so we set aside our normal uh, schedule and our normal uh, series that I've been doing on, on uh, who's the boss, women and men in biblical and cultural context. And we're talking about mental and emotional health. And what I promised you, and I fulfilled my promise, is that we're going to have a special guest today. So we have with us here today, Becky Castle Miller. Becky is a PhD student at Wheaton College, where she is studying New Testament with Dr. Esau McCauley. Uh, her dissertation research, and this is one of the reasons I'm so glad she's on here, is about emotions in the Gospel of Luke. She writes and speaks on emotional, mental, and spiritual health in the church. Uh, and she is a graduate from Northern Seminary, where she studied with Dr. Scott McKnight. Uh, many of you may know who he is. And she also wrote with him a discipleship workbook called Following King Jesus. She is married. She has a husband and their five kids and cat returned to the U.S. in 2020 after living in the Netherlands for eight years, where she served as discipleship director at an international church. Now, I have to say, I became aware of Becky and her work. Well, let me say this first. Becky, welcome. Glad you Thank are here you. with us. Thank you. Thanks so much. And speaking of the cat, you might hear him because he has decided to be very loud this morning. He keeps coming in and out of my office. If you hear me meowing, <laughs> I might introduce Bugaboo later if he jumps on my desk. Not a problem. <laughs> Well, I have to say, I was so excited to have Becky on because I heard her first through a mutual friend of ours, Nick Quint, and she, you did a podcast with him, and I happened to be listening to it, and I thought, oh, they're talking about emotions, and that's my thing. If anybody who follows me, they know emotions is Mike's thing, and I'm, uh, as I'm listening to her, I was astounded. I, she, was, she was saying things that I say. She was mentioning books that I have read and that I often reference. Uh, she was even saying things like, you know, I don't, I don't refer to emotions as negative. I, I talk about uncomfortable emotions unple or uh, uh, comfortable emotion. I thought, oh my gosh, that's the same thing that I do. And I, and I, I literally said to myself, she is a sister from another minister. I have got to talk to her because I was so excited about what you were saying. So I wanted to have her on. When I thought about doing, uh, setting aside the month of May for this, this special time of talking about mental and emotional health, you were one of the first people I thought. Because uh, I had contacted you and said, I want to interview you. And you said, yeah. So I, so when May came around, they said it was Mental Health Month. I thought, uh, I'm going to get talk to Becky and see if we can get her on. So again, so glad that you are here with us. I'm going to be asking Becky some questions. She's going to be responding. And for those of you that are watching, and for those of you that are in the Zoom room with us, if, if as she is talking, if you have any questions, write them in the chat. For those of you that are on Facebook, write your questions in the Facebook comments. We're going to have a question and answer period afterwards, so you can send your questions in. And I'm, I've got my phone here looking at it. So if you got any questions, just let us know and put those questions in there, and then I'll fill them to Becky, and she will answer them. Okay, so uh, let me turn mine because I don't want to be hearing myself as I'm doing this. So let me turn that down. Okay, there we go. Oops. I accidentally turned off the phone. Didn't mean to do that. All right, so we got this set up here. So Becky, I'm gonna be asking her a lot of questions. And I said, let me just say again, because one of the things that she is doing is, uh, as I understand, Becky, you wrote a master's thesis mm -hmm. on Jesus and emotion. So my question is, how have you come to see the importance of emotions? Anybody who follows me, they know that I talk a lot about emotions. Mm -hmm. How did you come to see the importance of emotions and emotional well-being in the church? How did you mm -hmm. come to this view? Mm -hmm. Well, I started off 
uh, growing up in Christian circles that did not give me good teaching on emotion. And in fact, led me in my quest to be a faithful follower of Jesus. I subconsciously picked up this idea that I needed to ignore or suppress my emotions in order to follow God faithfully. And so that was my teens and into my twenties. And then, um, because of, a really a mental health and emotional health crisis in my twenties, I had an emotional breakdown due to, um, unprocessed emotions and grief, but mm -hmm. also, uh, undiagnosed postpartum depression. So like that link between mental and emotional health was very real for me. And it was after that, that I started studying emotions and emotional health. And I realized what I had been taught was not sufficient or accurate was not accurate to, to scripture or to the way God's wor world works the way God designed our bodies to be. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I got interested in emotional health and started digging into the difference between healthy and unhealthy emotional approaches, uh, the way that spiritual abuse is uh, linked with bad teaching on emotion. Um, and the more I learned, the more I read the gospels, the more I saw how emotional Jesus was, um, the more I realized we were just missing something in the church by mm. not talking about this. And so oh, that is the cat. Sorry. The cat. Sorry if I don't let it <laughs> in. <problem. laughs> Cats don't like closed doors when they know you're on the <laughs> other side. Um, so I started trying to write a book about Jesus's emotions over 10 years ago. And as I got into it and was reading the gospels and taking notes on all the emotional expressions in the gospels, I realized I didn't have the research skills to do that subject justice. Okay. So uh, that's when I went to seminary and I did my master's thesis on emotions and discipleship in the gospels. I looked at historical Christian teaching on emotion um, in recent history, how it's influenced the American church and some of Jesus' emotions in the gospels. And one of the key uh, resources I used in writing the science chapter for that was Lisa Feldman Barrett, who wrote How Emotions Are Made, which I see there behind you. Um, I finished my master's degree and I realized I still wanted to keep researching this. There was more to explore. Um, and so I started this PhD program with a dissertation on emotions. Um, so that's a, <laughs> that's a brief story about my journey and my interest. This is my cat, Bugaboo. Hi, Bugaboo. <laughs> he is 17 years old. Ooh. He, he um, has been with us through our international moves and wow. he's my, he's my little buddy. So hopefully he won't interrupt. <laughs> no problem. So one of the things you said, and I, and I want to explore just a little bit, because it's something that I experienced too. You said that there were a lot of things that you were taught about emotions in the church. And by the way, folks, we're not here to bash the church, but we're going to do some honest all. things here. Mm -hmm. You were taught some things about the church where emotions are concerned that were not mm -hmm. good. What were some of the things that you heard growing up? Right. So one of the major gospel tracks uh, is the four spiritual laws written mm -hmm. by Bill Bright. And so probably a lot of us have seen it and it's an evangelistic message. Uh, but in that gospel track, which I think has been printed 2 billion times, not million billion, like so many copies of this are out there for the past 70 years on the last page is a train illustration where the engine is facts and the middle car is faith and the caboose is feelings. Okay. You mean <gasps> this one? No, that one. <laughs> Why do you have it? Exactly. And so kind of the unspoken fifth spiritual law, they don't call it the fifth spiritual law, but they do say blatantly in the tract, don't trust your feelings. Yeah. And so, so many people have been brought to Jesus with this gospel tract that tells them from the beginning of their faith journey, not to trust their feelings. Yeah. Now, I think the intention behind that was positive. It was to tell people, you can trust the truth of Jesus teaching. You can trust the truth of scripture. You can base your faith on those facts and then feelings will follow. You don't have to have any particular feeling to know that you're saved, which is true. Mm -hmm. I think that's an important message because people can chase an emotional experience to assure them of their salvation that just isn't necessary. Uh, but I think that that as the word feeling has changed, as our culture has changed, now when people read that, don't trust your feelings, they take it to mean I can't trust any of my emotions. 
Yeah. Like a key part of my faith is not trusting my emotions. Yes. And that is a very damaging teaching. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I remember there was, there was a very famous book that came out uh, years ago. Uh, I think it's called Emotions, Can You Trust Them? And it's by Dr. By James, James Dobson, yep. who has in many ways done a lot of good things for the body of Christ. But that book, I remember when it came out, um, and I remember reading it also because I was on my journey of trying to understand mm -hmm, emotions better. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, and the, and the question is, can you trust your emotions? And basically the right. answer is no. No, <laughs> no you can't. Uh, yes, I read that book and analyzed it in my master's thesis. He did have some good things to say about anger, mm -hmm. um, but he he also had some really wrong things to say about especially fear and anxiety. And he had a lot of incorrect things to say about women and emotions. And he had some illustrations in the book that are really concerning because mm -hmm. they're about women who are clearly in abusive situations and they have very valid and legitimate emotions that are God's warning signal to them to get out of there. But when mm -hmm. they came to James Dobson for counsel, he told them that their emotions were wrong, even sinful. And the problem was they needed to stay in the situation and just be more loving and forgiving and submissive. Yeah. Super yeah. problematic. Uh, that's not a healthy approach to emotions. Right. And this is coming from a psychologist who is also a Christian. Mm -hmm. So very much looked up to, listened to um, what he was saying was embraced as authoritative. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, okay, we should listen to this person. Something that I've often said, and you and I talked about this uh, when, we, when we talked uh, last week, is that uh, bad theology makes for bad psychology. Yeah. And if, if we get the theology wrong. And so would you say that where the church is concerned, we have had, for the most part, kind of a bad theology where emotions are concerned? I think so. It seems that a lot of the view on emotions in the church is influenced by really enlightenment philosophy. Mm -hmm. So this idea that uh, rationality is king and that we should be rational beings. And that means we shouldn't trust emotion, uh, which is a false dichotomy. And we can get into mm -hmm. the science of that. Like rational thinking, emotional thinking are not two separate things. They are all part right. of the same thought process. Like right. it, it all happens in the same process in our minds. Okay. Um, but let me just say real quick, folks, this is why I love talking to her. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. So I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm trying not yeah. to geek out here. So. <laughs> I <laughs> love geeking out. I am doing a, you know, a six year, 100,000 word dissertation on this topic. So I, I have to like geeking out about it or I would burn out. Hey, and, and, and I am so waiting for your dissertation. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. So I think that that secular philosophy actually has leached into the church. And what's interesting mm -hmm. is that a lot of the particularly male, white male leaders in the church would be absolutely against secular philosophy leading the church. And yet their views on emotion are very much driven by secular philosophy and, and outdated philosophy and outdated science on emotion. Uh, so that has, has strongly influenced. Um, and then at the same time, even though so many of the, uh, these ideas are based on secular philosophy, what they say out loud is we don't believe in secular science and we don't want that to lead what we teach in the church. So they reject a lot of modern psychology and neuroscience, which I think goes back to rejecting science on evolution. And kind of mm -hmm. after the evolution debate, a lot of fundamentalist Christians just said, forget science altogether. Mm -hmm. So they're not reading current psychology or neuroscience on emotion. Um, and instead of trusting in the counseling profession that has developed with good training and education and oversight and licensing, they reject um, counseling mm -hmm. as a profession and instead prefer biblical counseling or nuthetic counseling or soul care, mm -hmm. um, which is a potentially dangerous conflation of the very real need we have for pastoral care. Mm -hmm with the profession of counseling. Pastors offer important spiritual, emotional support in our lives. We need to be pastored. It's, a, it's an mm -hmm. important spiritual gift in the church, but pastors are not therapists. Right. And when people are expecting their pastor to be their, their counselor, their therapist, and the pastor is not a licensed counselor, you run into a lot of ethics violations, a lot of harm done in, in the name of, of pastoral counseling or biblical counseling. Um, 
And that messes people up emotionally. Mm -hmm. So there's both like an, an unspoken embrace of secular ideas of emotion and, and yet a rejection of secular ideas of psychology, emotion. So there's this messy dichotomy going on in the church. Yeah. So there's, so there is, so again, and a lot of that comes from just how we have viewed emotions. Cause I know when I, when I first started my journey, my wife and I, we started almost, it's, it's been, been over 30 years now. And we were talking about it this morning about how, when we started, we had to go outside the Christian community to start reading mm-hmm. because it was very, at that time, it was extremely limited. We're talking, we were married in 88. So we're talking early nineties. And so the material was very limited in terms of uh, talking about emotions and emotional health. Mm-hmm. It was mostly um, dealing with, uh, you know, well, you know, what should you do with your anger and what should you do with anxiety? Um, and like yeah. you said, it was, it was all kind of like, these things are bad, <laughs> you know, so you don't want to deal with it. And I was also taught this, you know, myself, I was taught the same thing. And what was interesting was, um, as Karen and I, my wife, we started studying this, you know, like I said, we, I remember reading one book that, and the idea was, there's not really much you can do about your emotions. It, it's not. So just, you know, make the right decisions, think the right way, act the right way, behave the right way. And the idea was, you know, as you act in faith, you're on the facts, eventually your emotions will be pulled along and they'll catch up and they'll be in alignment. And what I found out and so many people found out was that that's not really true. That didn't always happen. You know, the reason, like yourself, the reason I got into it was because there was something that I was going through emotionally. My wife and I were struggling with some things in our marriage at the time. We were looking for answers. And so we had to go outside. I remember at the time, I, I'll be honest with you, I was scared because it was like, oh, I shouldn't be reading these things. These things are taboo. We're told, you know, you don't read books on psychology. And, and neuroscience was still kind of, in one sense, it was in its infancy in terms of the things we know now. You know, I was reading a book by Richard Rastak called The Brain. That was like the most updated book on, on neuroscience at the time. Um, but it was, the, the, the theology was, I'll put it like this and I'm going to ask you another question. I remember um, uh, Martin Seligman, who passed president of the American Psychological Association. And he had, when he accepted the presidency in his speech, he started what's now known as the positive psychology movement. One of the things that he said that I thought was significant was he said, in the history of psychology, for the most part, we've been st- studying maladaptive emotions. We need to start studying emotional health. And I say that because when, when I heard that, I thought to myself, that's kind of where we've been in the church. We, we haven't really studied emotional health. We've talked about emotions as bad as sin. So my next question for you is, why should we in the church, why should we as Christians really be concerned about emotions? Because so I'm going to play the devil's advocate for a second. You know, we're told to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We're told we are to walk by faith. I grew up in the charismatic community. It's like we walk by faith, not by sight. We, we have to walk in the spirit. So it seems like biblically, there's. it seems like on the surface, there's not an emphasis on emotions. The emphasis is on living by God's word, obeying God's word, living in the spirit, walking by faith. And I was taught you do that no matter how you feel. So how you feel was not important. Why should we be concerned about emotions? Oh, you're muted. How did that happen? <laughs> I'm not sure how that happened that she got muted. Can you unmute? Are you able to unmute? No. Oh. And it won't let her unmute. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Karen, are you there? Do you have any insight as to what we can do? Because I'm I'm checking her. It just says chat and it's not allowing me to unmute her. Maybe we should just have you log out and log back in. Okay. So folks, we'll be right back. <laughs> Yay, it worked. Oh, there we go. Okay. okay uh, sorry, Karen. there's a set. It says the setting will not, the host won't let guests unmute themselves. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> so your question is. You want me to go back over your question? We, why should we care about feelings? Yeah. Because we kind of been taught not to. Yeah. Just live by they the word. Be obedient to the word. They don't matter. Right, right. And that, that feelings will follow. So the whole idea that there's nothing we can do about our emotions is outdated science. It's been disproven. 
the old idea, which really goes back to the Greek philosophers, was that these passions, for us to be virtuous, we needed to cultivate certain passions and not allow other passions to overtake us. We had to master our passions, but it was kind of seen as this battle. Mm -hmm. And I think we've carried that view forward into American culture. Um, and every culture has a different view and understanding of emotions. Some cultures don't even have a word for emotion. Right. And we can get more into that when we talk about, you know, culture and emotions, but in current American culture, um, there is still this idea that emotions are inborn. They're innate. We're kind of born with basic universal emotions and they are forces that act upon us. They're not always easy to control. They kind of come up unbidden. They're sort of hardwired into us. But the latest research is showing that emotions are constructions of our mind, which means that we learn emotion concepts over time. And then in an instance, we're able to pull up one of those concepts and construct it. So if I get angry, I'm able to do that. And I'm able to identify and say that I'm angry because I've had a lifetime of seeing instances of angry people and having my parents or teachers or other caregivers label those as anger. So this, di the diversity of angry experiences I've seen and had have been labeled. And that's become a concept in my mind, a concept mm -hmm. of anger, like anger with a capital A as Barrett uses in her work. And so when I feel certain sensations in my body in certain contexts that I know fit the category of anger, then I make meaning out of those sensations and I say that I'm angry. So if we can learn emotion concepts growing up, that means we can learn new emotion concepts as adults. It's not a process that happens quickly. So if I'm suddenly angry in a moment, it's very hard for me to reorient that or reconstruct it as it's happening, because though it's a complicated whole brain, whole body process, it happens in microseconds and it happens in the midbrain before the prefrontal cortex is engaged. Mm -hmm. So before we can even make a moral decision, we're already constructing the emotion. So it's not something that we can change quickly in the moment, but over time, we can control and change our emotions by learning new emotion concepts by reorienting our emotions, by tuning into our body's sensations and identifying what emotions those are by growing in our emotional granularity, the ability to say with specificity what we're feeling, not just angry as a big bucket, but kind of um, smaller categories. Am I irate? Mm -hmm. Am I raging? Am I furious? Am I, am I annoyed? Am I annoyed? Like what level yeah. of angry, what intensity of angry am I? Uh, and then looking at the causes of those emotions. So emotion is not this uncontrollable thing that happens to us that we can't change. Mm -hmm. It is um, something we construct and are essentially in control of, though it doesn't always feel that way. Um, as Barrett likes to say, you are the architect of your own experience. Right. So what you're so, saying, what ahead. you're saying, because this, this, this is, and, and well, what you're saying then is that when it comes to our emotions, contrary, as I like to always say, contrary to popular belief, we actually have more choice than we realize. Right. And that's an empowering understanding. Yeah. And we mean that as empowerment. When we say, yeah. when you say, and when Dr. Barrett says you construct it, that's not a, it's not meant as a negative. It's not meant as a condemnation. It's meant to, to empower. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are empowered over time to change our emotions, which is why I like to talk about the discipleship of our emotions. I think that uh, emotion is an aspect of our lives that needs to come under the authority of Jesus Christ, that mm -hmm. needs to be influenced by the power of the Holy Spirit, and is something that, that can be transformed in our lives as we become disciples in every aspect of our lives. So that gets to your question of why should we care about emotions when it comes to our lives of faith? Why should we not just ignore it? Well, we shouldn't ignore it because Jesus didn't ignore it. Mm -hmm. Jesus actually taught his disciples what to do with their emotions. Uh, we see that throughout the gospels where he says, for example, don't 
worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear, because your father in heaven sees your needs and is going to meet them. So he reorients their uh, obsession or their undue concern over material things and says, okay, here's a new emotion actually, that is faith in God's provision or hope for God's provision. And so when you start to be ruminating or fixating on these worries, here's actually a different emotion you can construct. And it's an emotion Mm -hmm. of faith and hope and trust. So I think it's, it's important to our spiritual lives to focus on emotion because Jesus does like, it's it's just as simple as that. Right. And and so going back to that for a second, because I think like that passage that you mentioned in Matthew six, uh, or at least one place is Matthew six. Yeah. We tend to, we, we read over that and, and we go, you know, oh, well, yeah, that's easy to say, you know, <laughs> don't. however, he does provide, I'm, I'm big into strategies and how-tos. So he does provide because he, he not only says your father will provide, but he says, behold, the fowls of the air. Look at the lilies of the field. It's like redirecting that attention away from where we ruminate. It's like shift your attention to what God is doing with the birds of the air, the, the lilies of the field, how he's provided how he's provided for them and think on that, focus on that. And you can see in, in which I, am I right to say that that, that lends to uh, building trust and confidence in God? Mm-hmm. Yeah, is absolutely. That, yeah. So it's building that, yeah. that concept, as you're saying, it's, it's building mm-hmm. a new concept where God's concerned. Right. And he doesn't just limit it to trust in this metaphoric future provision, but he actually takes actions to provide for people in tangible ways in the gospels, like the feeding miracles. He doesn't just see hungry people and say, Hey, don't worry about what you're going to eat. See you later. (laughs) He says, Hey, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Here's bread and fish. And in the same way, I think God designed the people of God to care for each other. So yes. there's also mutual care and provision for each other as we see acted out in the book of Acts, as we see in the epistles, um, God, God's design for community living is that we also care for each other. So don't worry because um, God is going to provide for you through the tangible hands and feet of your brothers and sisters. So are you saying then that these stories that we're reading, we see Jesus feeding, you know, the 5,000, we see these stories, like in the book of Acts, they all take their stuff, that these things should inform us and shape us not only intellectually, but also emotionally, that these stories have a purpose. Absolutely. I think they're illustrations of the solution. Hmm. They're, they're illustrations of the the miracles that God does want to do in our lives and the community care that's required in some cases to make those miracles happen. Mm -hmm. God does do miracles still healing miracles and provision miracles, but very often God does miracles through God's people. You you know, I, I've had experiences myself and I've read stories of people praying for provision for of groceries, for example, Mm -hmm. and then someone in their community drops off a load of groceries on their porch and says, I was, I was prompted by the Holy spirit to do this. That's a miracle that took human cooperation to make it happen. Um, Mm -hmm. God answers prayers often through each other. And so as we're looking at our emotional lives, we don't have emotions in a vacuum. Uh, so many of us as Americans have this view of emotion, that it's an inner state, Mm -hmm. uh, that emotion is something that we feel inside, but many other cultures have an understanding of emotion, that emotion is an experience that's shared between people. Mm-hmm. It's a relational act mm-hmm. or it's, it's an action. Sometimes in some languages, emotions are verbs, not nouns. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we see that, we see that in scripture as well, that, that word worry, merimnao is a verb. Um, so I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Sorry, I got up into the Greek. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> like that. I said, it's easy to geek out. It's- <laughs> yeah. So um, relational acts are also emotion. And so yeah. there's, there's that community aspect to our emotional health as well. It is very hard to get emotionally healthy on your own. One of the key components of a successful 
therapy experience is a good attachment to the therapist and that healing relationship, the sympathetic witness is so much of what brings healing in therapy. And so as we seek to become emotionally healthy, we need healthy community to support us. It's very hard to go from emotionally unhealthy to emotionally healthy, isolated. Yeah. And that's what I was going to say when you were saying about how God can use people to meet needs. So, and what that was to me was pointing to was that then that emotions and emotional well-being happens within community. Mm -hmm. Like you just said, it doesn't happen in isolation from other people. It happens within community. And we see that throughout scriptures of the the various things that we're told to do. Okay. So then how, how closely related, this is my next question, how closely related is spiritual health and emotional health? Are they intertwined uh, or are they completely separate from one another? Or, Or another way I can ask this of you is, can you be spiritually healthy and not be emotionally healthy? There are a lot of Theo bros on Twitter who would say that you can be, (laughs) but I would disagree with them because they are some of the most emotionally unhealthy and spiritually unhealthy people that I interact with. Um, Because emotion is not separable from other aspects of our being, it does play a part in our health. And because emotional connection and emotional attachment is so key to our relationships, We can't really have healthy community if we don't have emotionally healthy members of that community able to openly connect and share with each other. Um, And we, I think it hinders our relationship with God when we are not emotionally healthy, because if we don't know how to share intimately with another being, whether that's God or other humans, that limits, I think, the closeness we can experience with God. Um. It limits the correction that God can bring us. If we are so reactionary and defensive that we can't receive correction from the Holy Spirit, it will be very hard for us to grow as disciples. And that reactionary defensiveness is an aspect of emotional unhealth. Um, If we can't repair relationships between people, we can't be spiritually healthy because reconciled relationships are key to our lives as Christians. We Mm -hmm. are commanded over and over to be ministers of reconciliation. So if we cannot repair and reconcile relationship because we are emotionally unhealthy, we're missing a huge component of our spiritual life. Um, So I think there's a lot of aspects of emotional health that make our spiritual health possible or impossible. Yeah. I, and I agree. I agree hundred percent. I, I, I think they are intertwined. And also too, you know, when when I was, when I began, uh, in my thirties, beginning to do deeper studies and start studying history and culture and language. And I had some great teachers and mentors. One of the things that we start studying was what, what we back then called the Jewish roots of Christianity. So looking at the new Testament with, in light of first century Judaism. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I was taught was as we started looking at basically the anthropology of human beings, that we are a unified whole, mm-hmm. you know, um, and, and I was learning this in my biblical studies, you know, because in my charismatic background, I was taught, well, you are a spirit, you have a soul, you live in a body, and it was all separate, you know, even though, mm-hmm. you know, um, but then I was taught, no, you're, 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 you're this, while there's distinct aspects of ourselves, it's a, it's a whole, and one impacts the other. And then we, I begin to realize the science also bears that out, that we, we, we are integrated. You can't even make and you can speak to this, because I heard you speak to this on, on something else. I thought, wow, she's read that book. You can't even make a decision without emotions. Right. Though, though, though we have thought, if I really want to make a good decision, I've got to get my emotions out of the way mm-hmm. and just be, be like Mr. Spock, be logical. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, but that's not true, is it? Right. So Antonio Damasio has written a lot about this. There have been some experiments done. When people with brain injuries that impact their ability to construct and process their emotions... When those parts of their brain are damaged and they no longer connect to their emotions, they end up being either unable to make decisions or making very bad decisions, very bad judgment calls that completely destroy their lives. Even if they regain, they heal from the injury, they regain cognitive functioning, they can't cope with their lives anymore Mm -hmm. because their ability to use emotion in decision-making has been uh, eliminated or impacted. So emotion seems to be a really important part of decision-making. We should not be trying to make rational uh, decisions that are devoid of emotion because emotions 
uh, prepare our bodies to take action toward our goals. Mm -hmm. And so we actually need emotion to connect to what we value and prioritize, and then actually to prep us to take action to meet those goals that reflect our values. So emotion is actually a really important part of our decision-making process. Okay, so, and, and I agree with you on that. Uh, and thank you for articulating that so well, because I think it's one of the things that people tend to think that, oh, just get your, I, I used to think that way, like, just get my emotions out of the way, I will be fine. So that leads to my next question, which deals with, well, and again, I'll play devil's advocate. Becky, the Bible tells us though, to not walk in the lust of the flesh. Mm -hmm. First Peter even tells us to abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul. So are, does not the Bible present emotions and desires and passions as dangerous as being carnal and as of the flesh? Doesn't that tell us that emotions are untrustworthy? J James says, every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own desires and when desire hath conceived to bring forth sin. So how can you say that mm -hmm. we need emotions? Because yeah. it, it seems to me like the Bible is teaching they're dangerous. Right. It cannot be overstated how important it is to realize the difference between a desire and an emotion. Mm -hmm. Desire and emotion are two completely separate things. An emotion is not a temptation. An emotion is not a desire. An emotion is not a sin. An emotion is the meaning our minds make from our body's sensation in our context, based on our language, our experience, our interoception, what's going on inside our bodies, our prediction of what's about to happen next. Emotion has nothing to do with desire. Now, desires may sometimes have emotions attached to them or may stir emotion in us or may give us a circumstance in which to construct an emotion. You know, if I want um, a better job, I desire strongly to have a better job with a promotion so that I have more money. Um, that might stir up or cause me to construct the emotion of greed or avarice or an unhealthy competitiveness. Like there might be emotions. I might be jealous of someone else in that position mm -hmm. or envious. Um, I might hate the person who has that job that I don't have. So there can be emotions that come as a result of a desire. Mm -hmm. But the desire is separate from the emotion. Okay. And as our desires are shaped to be more Christ-like, so will our emotions be. Yeah. And is it possible, too, that sometimes, like, some of the desires that we have can come from unmet needs that are going on within us? Absolutely. And so we're, 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 we're one, of the, one of the concepts that, that I often deal with in, in the coaching that I do with people is that um, th that behind all behavior as a rule, there tends to be a positive intention. There's something that you're trying to do for yourself that's good. And what the way I usually explain to people is what, and we, we try to drill down to what is it that you actually really want? What do you really want? Mm -hmm. And then we talk about there's a, that what you want may be fine. However, the way you're going about it is a problem, <laughs> you know, because you're, what I usually say, I said, what you want, your intention is great. Your strategy sucks though. The way you're trying to go about it, it just it's just really bad. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I have found that when people, and, and I wanna ask you about this, when people, when we share that, people stop being afraid of their desires. Right. And, and, but often in the Christian life, we're taught desires are bad, desires are, you know, or this was, this was the thing I often heard. If you wanna do it, it's probably not God. Oh, absolutely. If you I don't want to do it. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, could you yeah. speak to that about <laughs> yeah. that teaching messes people up so much. Uh, the idea that if you want something, God probably doesn't want you to have it. And if you do not want something, then that's probably God's will for you. Where does that even come from? That is not remotely biblical. <laughs> In fact, scripture tells us that God will give us the desires of our heart when we're seeking him. Mm -hmm. um, so that messes people up so deeply because it teaches them to completely distrust the entire intuition system that God's built them with. God created us with intuition. That is a tool that keeps us safe in the world. Mm -hmm. God created us with discernment 
And when we believe that teaching, we throw all that discernment out the window. We begin to distrust the very discernment that God gave us to protect us. And what it can often do is leave us vulnerable to abusive spiritual leaders Mm. who will say, you can't know what God wants for you. I can know what God wants for you. That vocational calling you think you have, that's not from God. What God really wants you to do is to be like my personal assistant and build my ministry. That's what God wants for your life. And we have no discernment or intuition left uh, to be able to counter that kind of abusive control. Um, Now, I think it's clear, especially in some of Paul's writings, we can have sinful desires. Mm -hmm. Sin, the the evil force of sin in the world, acts upon us Mm -hmm. to cause us to have sinful desires, to tempt us. So there certainly can be desires that sin kind of acts upon us with to try to cause us to desire things that are sinful. But I think the very fact that you have to modify desires with sinful, like it is sinful desires that are wrong, means that other desires that are not sinful are perfectly fine. Um, So knowing what is sin, and there's going to be variation in that because um, as Romans 14 and 15 show us. Um, there is, there's room for difference of conviction in the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. What is sin for one person, because they have a conviction about it. Someone else may not have a conviction about the same thing. And so what is, what I feel might be a sinful desire for me, someone else might want the same thing. And for them, it's, it's not a sin because it's a conviction difference. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if someone has a conviction that drinking alcohol is wrong, if they are tempted to buy a bottle of wine and drink it, that to them might be a sinful desire, mm-hmm. right. but it's probably like pointing to a self-protective need they have. But right. then for someone else who has no conviction about drinking alcohol, they have a healthy relationship with alcohol and they can say, I'd really like a bottle of wine tonight for them. That's not a sinful right. desire. Um, well, so there's just, yeah, there's a lot. This, there. Goes, this goes back to though, what you said about that we construct our emotions. Mm-hmm. Um, and in Romans 14, Paul talks about there are those who believe You can eat anything you want and you're fine. Then there are those who believe that certain foods are off limit and makes you unclean. And he says to him who uh, deems something to be unclean, to him. To him it is sin. It's it's, it's sin. It's unclean. And it says, and don't grieve your brother. And I will will often use that to show it's the meaning that you give to it. It's Because Paul said, I know that in the Lord, everything is clean. However... And so, again, it, it, I think that's a great example and goes back to what you said before, referencing Dr. Barrett's work, that we construct. And what Paul didn't do is Paul didn't condemn those who held that conviction, but it seems to be clear that they feel this way because of the meaning that they give to certain foods. Right. And he's very clear that we're not to judge those who have different convictions from ourselves. Right. We're, not right. supposed to, we're not supposed to compel those people to put the same limits on themselves that we put on ourselves. And right. we're not to judge those who have different limits. Right. I, and, and I want to go back to, and it, and it goes to my next question, because you were talking before about how there can be desires that are sinful. As I was saying before, because I've worked with a lot of people and like I've worked with people who have you know, been unfaithful in their marriage. But I'll be honest with you, I've, I have yet to really work with someone who was unfaithful because they woke up one morning and just decided, yeah, I'm going to be unfaithful. Not just, usually it's a process. Usually it's things that they've gone through. I, I remember working with someone one time that they were acting the way they were acting and it was because of a trauma a wound that they experienced early in their life where they felt like they literally said, once we, we started to uncover it, the belief that they had was there is something wrong with me and people leave me. And it was causing them to act in ways that was creating destruction in their marriage because of this one belief. And so while they had certain feelings and emotions and desires, um, it was springing from a, and and I think this is something that, I think a lot of times within churches, we don't deal with this, is that it can come from a lie. You know, um, Ephesians talks about, uh, you know, put off the old man, which was corrupt according to deceitful lust. I remember one translation said, lust that spring from deceit. And I look at that and I was like, you know what? I said, there are times there are lies there that will, going back to concepts again, it will shape how we're thinking and feeling. 
So my next question is going back into the impact that trauma Mm -hmm. and past emotional wounds, how does that impact our Christian walk and life? Absolutely. And is that something we need to look at? Yeah. And I think to have that conversation, it's also important to distinguish between uh, an emotion and a reactivity. Mm -hmm. Um, And maybe even, maybe even a step simpler. Uh, There is a difference between an emotion and a feeling. Mm-hmm. And we've kind of uh, used those terms. I know that you and I are using those terms really carefully, but I, but not everyone listening is going to have noticed probably the nuance that we're giving right. the difference between feeling and emotion. So just to be clear, a feeling is a sensation. Yeah. You can feel hungry. You can feel hot. You can feel cold. You can feel tightness. I, in stub, your chest. I stub my toe. I feel That's pain. That's a sensation. You feel pain. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, but a feeling does not have meaning until we give it meaning right. and the meaning that we give to our feelings with these added ingredients of language, culture, context, prediction is an emotion. So feeling and emotion that we use them interchangeably, like the facts, faith, feelings, train uses mm-hmm. feelings for the, the alliteration, which I, you know, as a preacher, I respect a good alliteration. <laughs> I love a three point <laughs> sermon with three F's. It's great, but feeling, I think it means emotion there. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, right. So it, I think it's important to, to use emotion when we mean a meaning mm-hmm. making thing, not just a sensation. And then there's a difference between an emotion and a reaction. When we are suddenly thrown into distress in our bodies and we feel these sensations kind of rising up in us and we, we have this cascade of beliefs of past wounds that are being triggered, physical sensations as a result, and then this desire to impulsively take action. Mm -hmm. And if we're not emotionally healthy, and if we have a lot of unhealed wounds, often those actions that we take are going to be maladaptive and are going to harm us and other people. But that whole sense of reactivity is not an emotion. And I think a lot of times when people say, don't be so emotional, what they mean is don't be so unhealthily reactive, which that's a fair thing to say. Like all of us, I mm-hmm. think should aspire to not be robots, not be Spock, not be unemotional, but we should be, we should aspire to have self-control. Right. It is a fruit of the spirit. And when we are in self-control, um, we will make better decisions based on our emotions Right. Um, and we will not harm others. So when we are thinking about you know, reactivity and emotion, um, it's important to note that that kind of rush of all of the stuff that's going on in our bodies is not necessarily an emotion. It might have emotions attached to it. Again, like desire, there are emotions there, but the desire is separate from the emotion. The, the reaction mm-hmm. is separate from the emotion. So when we start paying attention to our reactivity, it can be a trailhead that starts us down a path to find a wounded part of ourselves that Jesus very much wants to heal. Yeah. And the more we pay attention to those wounded parts and care for ourselves and open up those wounds with trusted witnesses and heal them, the less reactivity we will have because there will be fewer festering wounds to be triggered and to set us off into those reactions where we sometimes make bad decisions. All of that reactivity is coming out of good and important parts of ourselves. But those parts are protecting us from re-experiencing old wounds. Yes. And so they will do anything to protect us out of a good desire because God created us with this self-protective ability. But then the, the choices we make or the beliefs we have about what's going on in the world, like what, what you mentioned, the person you were talking about, I, uh, there's something wrong with me and people will leave me. That is a belief based on a past experience and an unhealed Mm -hmm. wound that gives rise to emotions, probably shame and Mm -hmm. fear and, Mm -hmm. uh, a desire to control situations. Um, Mm -hmm. yes, a hesitance to commit a hesitance to be intimate if you can go back to the situation that caused that wound, heal that part of yourself, correct that wrong belief, 
and begin to believe, no, there's nothing wrong with me. Mm -hmm. I'm transformed by the Holy Spirit. God has made me good and new again. And I can trust safe people not to abandon me. Then we, we stop being reactive. And then the emotions right. that we construct instead of shame and fear are love and trust and safety. Right. I think that's so important because sometimes we can see people, especially other Christians, and they're doing things. And going, Why are they doing that? But when you trace it back, you begin to find out, like you just said, there are wounds there. There are pains there that they've experienced. And what you said with this person was exactly it. They were engaging in, in certain behaviors that, that it, was, it was causing their marriage to deteriorate. And, and we, he and I sat down one day and we looked at it real close. And, and we, like I said, we, found, we, we uncovered this belief that he had. And doing some works and some tool and stuff that I work with, uh, we, we, we exchanged it you know, for the truth of God. And it, it, it just, it, like you just said, it transformed him. It just totally changed how he was thinking. And he saw, oh, and he, I remember him, he, he said, oh my gosh, I, I didn't realize that was there. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these wounds, would you say, they, they can be, um, people, they can be unaware of them. They can be unconscious. Yes. And people can yes. be confused about their own behavior. Absolutely. We are, by design, those wounds are hidden from us. Yeah. God created us with self-protective systems. When we have really wounded parts of ourselves, our mind kind of exiles them and says, that was so painful. We're never going to feel or experience that again. I have to hide that away. And then we develop these kind of managers to, to keep that pain away from us so that we don't experience it again. And when anything begins to come close to that wound, those manager parts of us are like, no, like react. Don't let mm -hmm. that painful part be touched. And it's, it's really kept kind of in our subconscious. If you want to use that word, mm -hmm. we're not actively aware of it because our mind is trying so hard to keep us from remembering it so right. that we're not in pain. And this is a good thing. It keeps mm -hmm. us from completely breaking down and, and, and being uh, incapacitated. But when we're in a safe place in life and when we have trusted support systems, we can begin to say, no, I, it's okay. I can look at my wounds. Mm -hmm. I can address them. I can heal them. And I don't have to do all this behavior that's keeping me from feeling that pain anymore. But we can have kind of parts of ourselves that are polarized. And so we're kind of confused by our own behavior. And Paul addresses that. He says, I mm -hmm. do what I don't want to do. And I don't do what I ought to do. I think that's a polarization inside himself because part right. of him wants to do something and another part of him doesn't want to do that because both, both of those parts are trying to protect him maybe from different things. And so mm -hmm. there comes like that internal conflict, but mm -hmm. those kinds of, of internal polarizations can also be addressed. And a lot of yeah. these ideas that I'm sharing here are coming from the internal family systems model of, of right. therapeutic support, which I've been a client of for four years and have found really transformational in my life. So, well, pastors are not therapists, and I agree with you on that. And most pastors have had, I have wonderful friends that are pastors. And usually, for, and, and I tell people, I said, I'm not a therapist, I'm a coach. I do work helping people to find more empowerment where their emotions are concerned. So a lot of my pastor friends send their people to me to work with because I've studied this for so long. However, how important is it for pastors to be aware mm -hmm. of, of what we just talked about, that sometimes what your people are doing, it's not because they're trying to be bad or they are bad. It's yeah. because of trauma. Absolutely. It's so important for pastors to be trauma informed. Um, if you look at the, just the instances of trauma in our culture, there's probably half or more of your church is dealing with trauma of, of one kind or the other. Mm -hmm. um, it, statistics would show that one in three women and one in six men has been sexually assaulted by the time they're 18. So just if you're talking about sexual abuse and trauma from that alone, you know, a third of your church or more is dealing with that. Um, if, you know, then you factor in domestic violence or child abuse or child neglect or people who are coming from war, 
people who are coming from combat, people who've been through natural disasters, people who've been in car accidents. Mm -hmm. So many of us are carrying unhealed trauma because we experienced bad things and then didn't have safe people supporting us as we healed. And so we've developed post-traumatic stress or complex post-traumatic stress. Um, so pastors need to be aware that very many people and themselves probably included are carrying wounds of unhealed traumas. Mm -hmm. Um, and so at a bare minimum, pastors need to read books on trauma, educate themselves on it, maybe get some training and realize a pastor cannot heal the brain injury of trauma. You know, it's a medical physical problem that also has spiritual and emotional components, mm -hmm. but the physical healing needs to be done by a trained licensed trauma counselor who has the the technical skills to really heal someone's brain that's been mm -hmm. injured. But mm -hmm. alongside that, they do need spiritual support from their pastor and their church community. They need a safe place to heal while they're engaging in healing work with their that therapeutic relationship. So pastors need to be aware of the extent of trauma, some of the symptoms of trauma. They need to not pathologize or condemn people who are just simply showing very normal trauma symptoms. Mm -hmm. They need to not tell people their trauma symptoms are sin because they are not there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Got safety <laughs> system built into our bodies. Um, and, and, and would you also say we should not tell people just get over it? Oh, absolutely not. No, like that's, yeah. that's pastoral malpractice. It's, if, if you want to see my wife get upset. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. For her to hear something. Yeah, Karen called it spiritual malpractice. Yeah. She says just to tell really people to just get over it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It. yeah. So pastors need to be aware of the extent of trauma, the symptoms of trauma, and they need to be aware of their limitations. Yeah. Unless you are a trained and licensed counselor with specific training in trauma healing, do not attempt to heal trauma. That's yeah. not your job. It's not your role. It's not your calling. Refer people to a trained trauma counselor, pay for it if you can. That's such a key thing that yeah. churches do. Um, but don't, don't expect that you can heal trauma through your work in pastoral counseling. Yeah. So I got a couple more questions. Um, and let me just say for those of you that are watching, if you have any questions, if you're watching on Facebook, write your questions in the chat. I have my phone here to see if there's any questions coming. And for those of you here in the Zoom room, if you have any questions, write your questions and I will address them to Becky when we come to that portion. Okay. So you, like you said, pastors need to know their limitation. I agree with that so much. Because uh, I've seen so many people hurt, mm -hmm. you know, um, one of my mentors, a guy by the name of Dr. Bob Bonehammer, who works a lot with people, I, I, I studied under him and worked with him. One of the things that Bob would say, Bob grew up in the Southern Baptist uh, tradition, and he, he's actually, uh, he lives in uh, North Carolina, and he may be watching this, but Bob, Bob is a true, he himself said, he's a true hillbilly from the Appalachian Mountains. And he talks just like this, and he just, one of the smartest men I know, though. One of the things that he would often say is, he said, you know, I found out real quick that just preaching by itself was not enough. So that goes into my next question. Should Christians get professional help or is reading the Bible, prayer, and biblical counseling, is that enough? Is that all we need? Because people will say, well, isn't Christ and the scripture sufficient? And if we are seeking out counselors and therapists, are we then not saying that Christ is not sufficient? Right. Well, the Bible says Christ is sufficient, but for what? Mm. Like he's sufficient for our salvation and our transformation, our sanctification by the power of the Holy Spirit. Christ is sufficient for that. But not every wound or problem in our lives and our bodies is healed by salvation. We will be made whole in heaven, like in the mm -hmm. new creation. But in the now, there are still holistic aspects of our lives that need to be addressed. And I actually believe that salvation is, in, is intended to be holistic. That's why Jesus healed people's bodies and fed their stomachs in addition to saving them. There is like salvation is supposed to be a holistic healing. And some of the ways that that is accomplished in the world is through trained medical professionals. When we have physical problems in our bodies, we go to doctors. Mm -hmm. You know, when we have cancer, we go to an oncologist. Well, when we have PTSD, we should go to a trauma therapist. Um, there are, 
Can, can I say somewhere that's concerned for a moment? Yeah, absolutely. That's something I have never understood in the in the body. When I got into this, mm-hmm. like you just said, if you have a problem with cancer, you go to the doctor. Mm-hmm. If you have a problem with your throat, you go to a throat doctor. But when it came to getting mental and emotional help, we were like, no. <laughs> and I and I I was like, why in the world do we stop? Well, I know why we stopped there, because I've heard the argument, well, psychology comes from suke, suke has to do with the soul. And so therefore only Christ should deal with the soul. But you're saying no, that, that or yeah. not no, you're saying, yes, Jesus does deal with it. However, the way that he deals with it can be through other trained mm-hmm. professions. Right. All good in the world, I think, is from God and of God. There is so much good in God's creation that scientists are aware of, just as there's so much good mm-hmm. in God's creation that pastors are aware of, and they might be looking at different aspects of the goodness of God's creation. And newer understandings of psychology and neuroscience seem to show that emotion is a physical thing mm-hmm. and trauma is a physical thing. And the combinations of our minds and our bodies and our spirits these intertwined systems, when one part is damaged, the whole doesn't work the way God intended it to. Mm. So because, you know, psychological problems are to do with the brain and body, um, then it's important for us to seek physical help for that. There's not a separate spirit there. I mean, there are different models of like mind, body, soul, spirit, right? right? But trying to heal only someone's spirit while leaving their body and mind out of it, I think is, is insufficient care right. and, right. and spiritual care is important. And when our spirits are struggling, sometimes our bodies are too. But mm-hmm. sometimes our bodies are struggling and it makes us think that our spirits are struggling. Mm-hmm. We may feel like we lack faith or we're struggling in our relationship with God, but it's just because we're burned out and tired because we didn't right. care for our bodies. Like they're so intertwined. Right. Or, or you might reach a certain age and your body starts going through changes and that could be affecting it. Mm-hmm. You know? So one of the things that Dr. Uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett talks about it is your body budget. Yeah, And looking at things you need to consider. And I know in the training that we do uh, a few years ago, we started to incorporate that because it's like, oh yeah, you do need to think about your physical body and the impact that that has upon, you know, what you put in your body, what you're eating, how much sleep that you're getting, um, how much stress are you actually experiencing, you know, all of the, all of those things, that things that we tend not to think about sometimes. Yeah. Dr. Barrett tells a funny story in her book of being in college and thinking that she was in love. She had all these like fluttery feelings, didn't know what was going on. And then 24 hours later, she started throwing up and it turns out that she had the flu, not like a stomach virus. It, she was not in love, but she yeah. misinterpreted like this, the body stuff and had constructed this whole like relationship out of it. But actually she just needed to lay in bed for a few days yeah. and recover. And I so think we, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Which is it's so intertwined and yeah. and caring for only someone's spirit and neglecting their body is just not not a reflection of what Jesus ministry was all about. Jesus came in a body to minister okay. to bodies. So Christians who we've established that people do at time need to get professional help. Should Christians only go to a Christian counselor or therapist? I think it depends on their needs and it depends on those person, that person's credentials. Um, I do not think that people should go to see a biblical counselor or a nuthetic counselor and think that that will provide actual therapeutic healing or support. Let's define that for a moment because there's some people yeah. may not be aware of what a biblical yeah. or nuthetic counselor is. What do you mean by that? So there is a school of uh, approach I'm not even going to call it a school of counseling. It's really not counseling. Um, yeah. Jay Adams was a leading proponent of this. And it is counsel or like advice giving is a better phrase for it based on scripture. And it's supposed to help people identify sin in their lives and change and base their thinking on the Bible. And that's supposed to heal all of their ills. 
in their minds, but it is not trained, licensed psychological help. These people do not have um, counseling degrees. They're not, you know, LPCs, licensed professional counselors, um, and are not not actually trained to provide professional counseling. Um, now you can go to a licensed counselor who is a Christian. And that might be what some people need. They can integrate faith and practice. It was beneficial for me to see a therapist who had been a pastor and a Bible translator and also mm -hmm. had 30 years of experience and licensing in trauma therapy, was certified in EMDR, et cetera. Um, because I was coming with trauma from spiritual abuse and he, his context I didn't have to sit around and explain like the abuse crisis in the American church because he was familiar. Like he right. knew if I said Ravi Zacharias, he knew exactly what that whole situation was about. If I said Bill Hybels, like he was, he knew the culture, he knew the teachings, he knew the key players. It saved me a lot of time mm -hmm. and effort in therapy to work with someone who knew exactly what I was dealing with. Um, in that case, it was very beneficial to me to have a counselor with a Christian background. But um, a good counselor, even if they are a Christian, just like a good doctor, even if they are a Christian, can provide care for someone regardless of their patient's faith status. Right. And so a Christian counselor should be able to provide counsel to someone and use their counseling skills and not need to bring faith into it and still help that person. Right. Um, and some people will have better help from a secular counselor who is trained and licensed and has the skills needed to heal that per particular person's wounds and meet their needs, diagnose them, et cetera. Um, and in some cases, I think people are actually safer seeing a secular counselor because not all Christians are up to date on the latest psychology, neuroscience, understanding of emotions, understanding of abuse, understanding of trauma. And in fact, would let their faith communities' perspectives limit their ability to care and limit their knowledge of, of skills in the field. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I think it takes a lot of discernment to know what type of counselor is best for you. If it's important to you and helpful to you to have a Christian that you align with, or whether it's just better for you to get a professional who meets your needs. Um, you know, if you wouldn't ask your oncologist about their faith before they start <laughs> treating you for cancer, do you really need to know? where your counselor is at, because a good counselor isn't going to force their faith onto their client. That would be a breach of ethics, right? They can use their counseling skills without necessarily needing to bring faith into it. Yeah. Right. So yeah. And, and, um, and someone else wrote, they said, yeah, not all therapists are, up, not all therapists are up to date, which is yeah. true. It takes discernment yeah. for either. I, I know within the Christian community, um, I, there are people who get concerned and I understand the concern. I do it. Cause I, people said there are times Karen and I, we, we recommended people to say, Hey, you need to go see a therapist. You know, mm -hmm. we'll help you find one or we'll, we'll pay for it. There are times we've actually mm -hmm. paid for it. Um, but people are like, you know, I want to make sure I have a Christian therapist. And my thing is always, are they skilled? Yeah. <laughs> Can they help you get from yeah. here to here? Uh, but I understand the concern that they might tell me something because there's been a lot of, which again, I do understand, but there's been a lot of, almost where you can make therapy psychology a boogeyman mm -hmm. and you don't see the, the good that is there. I'm not saying that, every, that there hasn't been problems because there has been, yeah. but, but it, it, in the same way as we've been saying, but there's also been problems with Christian theology in terms of how we think about ourselves and think about our mm -hmm. emotions. Mm -hmm. So uh, two more questions. Um, how, what can pastors and spiritual leaders do to nurture and support good mental and emotional health in their churches? Mm -hmm among the congregations. Yeah. Well, first they need to take care of themselves. Oh, say that again for the people in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Pastors and spiritual care providers need to make sure they are emotionally and spiritually healthy, that they are attending to their own needs before they lead others into health. Uh, an unhealthy spiritual leader can cause so much trauma for yes. the people in their community. Um, if they're reacting regularly out of their own unhealed wounds, they will unintentionally very badly damage the people they're supposed to be caring for and protecting. So the first thing is uh, do an inventory of yourself. Do you 
can you articulate your own emotions? If someone asks you, how are you feeling? Can you really um, introspect and express how you're feeling? Um, and then um, go to go to therapy. Okay. Um, now I gotta tell you, now you, you know in the black community, in the black churches, when you say something that we just think is so wonderful, we just go, you know, just, <laughs> girl, you going on here. But no, <laughs> what you said is so, Karen and I, we talk about this and we teach this all the time. We see so many, I work in the, in the work I do outside of the church in terms of working in corporation. I work with leaders. I see so much unhealthiness in the secular and in the church. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what you're saying is so important. Yeah, it, you you need to heal your own wounds, make sure that you're acting in a healthy place, um, and then you can begin to lead others to that healthy place. Um, now, that's not to say that pastors who are dealing with mental or emotional struggles should not be pastoring. I'm not saying that at all. Sometimes wounded healers are the best healers. They mm-hmm. if they themselves have been through pain and right. know what it's like, they are the best ones to bring healing to others. When God has met them and comforted them, they can then offer that comfort to others. And that's, that's scriptural. Like we comfort mm-hmm. others with the comfort with which we have been comforted, which is one of the most difficult Bible verses to recite, <laughs> but I think I got it right. Um, right. So if, if you have a mental illness, if you are carrying trauma, if you have emotional wounds, you can still pastor, but you, you have to be really careful and have some accountability and some outside perspective to make sure that you're in a healthy enough place that you're not harming right. yourself or others. And I see a couple of questions in the chat. Do you want me to address yeah. those now or wait? Yeah. So one of the questions is, how do you address the pastors who say, because we do hear this a lot, that they can't be vulnerable and they have no one to connect with? Um, and then I'll, and I'll ask the second one. So let, let you ask that one first. Yeah. It's a huge problem. Pastors are very lonely. A loneliness crisis among pastors is a massive concern to ministry leaders and those who equip pastors, uh, seminary presidents and faculty are really worried about this. How, how do we help pastors address this loneliness? Because when you're leading a congregation, it feels weird to be friends with people in the congregation. It feels scary. You don't know if they're going to betray you or use that vulnerability against you. Mm-hmm. Um, so some good suggestions I've seen include having friends outside of your church, do hobbies and have other community groups where you make friends who are not connected with your church so that you have good friends who have no influence on your paycheck. Um, and then try to have other pastor friends in the area, like a pastor's support group where you're supporting each other, which again, can still be scary. And you could be afraid they would use your vulnerabilities to attack you. And it is certainly always possible, but if you can build a trusted community of pastors across traditions, that is actually a beautiful gift to the body of Christ, because you're living out the kind of unity that Paul envisioned for the Roman Christians. Um, And you can learn from each other. You can learn from people who are in different Mm -hmm. Christian traditions. Um, And then the beautiful thing about a therapist is that an ethical therapist will keep your sessions confidential. And you can say anything in that safe therapeutic relationship and get support. Now, a therapist is not your friend, but they are your confidant, supporter, healing, sympathetic witness, um, and can really help you cope with the loneliness. So there are some things pastors can do, but I do acknowledge it is a very hard and lonely road, especially because you are a secret keeper. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You carry people's stories and you are trying to keep that confidentiality and there's no one you can talk to. Yeah. So having, you know, a supervisor, if your church tradition has a healthy hierarchy, if you can go to a bishop or, you know, a spiritual director or someone where you can safely share those confidential stories that you need help carrying, it's important to have that as well. Yeah. I, I know for myself, I have I have several friends that I meet with, talk to on a consistent basis where we share, our, they're, they're in ministry um, and we talk about frustrations. I have one of my friends is Pastor Willie Estrada and I was, he was used to be the senior pastor. I was the assistant pastor at the church. He and I would meet regularly and talk. And then after I left, we still get together. 
<laughs> Matter of fact, we're planning to meet in about two weeks and just have, and we just talk. We just, you know, how are you doing? We just check on each other. I have other friends that we do that with. I'm wondering too, and then we'll go to the next question. One of the things that's often concerned me, and we try to do this in our fellowship, and that is we're a family. And really, and sometimes it seems to me with pastors that I've talked to, they see themselves as a part and not a part of the family. So they're always standing apart. Mm -hmm. And in our fellowship, we've always tried to do it where, hey, we're a family here. We, and, and, and we do emphasize this is, needs to be a safe place for people. Um, I, I said from the beginning, we are not TNT. We don't do drama, meaning we don't form cliques. We don't form, we are a family. And I'm wondering sometimes too, if pastors, um, because I know I was kind of raised in a tradition. I was raised in a tradition where, you know, you're the pastor, you're over here and the people are over here. And I remember hearing a pastor say to a, I was working at a Bible school and I happened to be walking by a class of a pastor who was talking to up and coming pastors. And he said things like, never let them see you cry. Never show your emotion. I'm like, oh my gosh, that is so unhealthy. You know, cause it was like, cause it, it, it creates that mindset again of I gotta go do, I gotta handle all the stuff by myself. Yeah, so and that's very unhealthy. And we don't see that model from the apostles at all. We don't see that model from Jesus. Jesus let his followers see him weep. Right. He let well, them see him in anguish. Yes. Yeah, he I was gonna say he, he literally said to his his 12 disciples, My soul is exceeding, exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Mm -hmm. Come pray with me. He invited he, he, them into his vulnerability. And these were his disciples. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And we see the same thing with Paul. If you remember the kind of closing one of the near the book of at the end of the book of Acts, when Paul leaves Ephesus for the last time, he and the his his colleagues there are like on the beach in the harbor on their knees weeping together. Mm -hmm. Like it's a very evocative scene. And Paul mm -hmm. never seemed to shy away from even when he was bringing correction to or guidance to a church his letters are full of his very vulnerable emotions. And so yeah. I don't think that pastors should keep themselves walled off uh, and isolated and unemotional before yeah. their congregations. Yeah. And I'm wondering, that's, I'm wondering if that is one of the causes of some of the spiritual abuse we've been seeing is that pastors have kept themselves and their own hurts and pains walled off because they think they're not supposed to have it. The other question here, and then we're going to move on to our last question, is how do you respond to the concept of bleeding mm -hmm. while leading? Yeah, bleeding while leading, meaning you still have an active open wound that's kind of bleeding everywhere, but you're trying right. to lead while you're doing that. That is really hard for you and your people. There are different schools of thought on this, but... As a healthy parent does not shoulder their children with their emotional burdens. Mm -hmm. So it's probably good for healthy pastors to not shoulder their congregation with their emotional burdens. There's a difference between being closed off and invulnerable and making people responsible for your emotions, right? right. You can be open about your emotions. You can cry in front of people, but you also can make it clear. I have a therapist. I'm seeing them regularly. Mm -hmm. I have a support team. You don't need to support me. I want you to see my vulnerability. I want you to know that I trust you with my tears, but you don't have to carry the weight of, of caring for me. I am here yes. to care for you. Right. Um, you know, I let my kids see me cry. I let my kids see me angry, but I try to be very careful to say, you are not responsible for my emotions. Mm -hmm. I am responsible for my emotions. You don't care. You don't care. Take for me. I care. Take for you. Mm -hmm. So there is that if you have such open wounds that you're making your congregation feel like they need to be your caretakers, I think you get, you get just kind of some messiness in the relationship there, mm -hmm. because as the pastor, you still have power and mm -hmm. you have to steward that power very carefully. So it does not become abusive or controlling. Right. Um, and so knowing if you're in a healthy enough place to lead while still making sure that you are caring for yourself is a, is an important balance. Um, stepping away for a time, taking a sabbatical, getting the support and health that you need so that you can lead from a place of emotional strength is really important. At the same time, 
you just, you need a good spiritual support discernment team to help you make those decisions. Yes. Um, there's a pastor I know of who is fighting his second battle with cancer mm -hmm. and he's trying to pastor through it. And he's been open with his church about this physical struggle he's having. He is continuing to pastor while fighting cancer and being open with it and navigating that the difficult yeah. space with his church. And they're very understanding about his physical limitations, but he's still pastoring well. In the same way, let's say you have a diagnosed mental illness or battling depression or bipolar disorder or anxiety or something. I think you can still pastor through it if you are aware of your limitations and getting the help and support that you need. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a delicate balance there. Yeah. Yeah. I know my, the friends that I was telling you about earlier, uh, Pastor Willie Estrada and his wife, who pastored, they pastored a church uh, years ago called By a Spirit. They were going through a difficult time in their marriage. And one of the reasons I so respect them is that they recognize because they were the leaders, this is starting to affect the church. So they went, found a counselor, and they stepped down from ministry. They still went to the church, but they they had the, the at this point, um, I had not joined the church. I was pastoring somewhere else. But they had, you know, they turned it over to the elders. They brought in guest speakers. I was one of the guest speakers they brought in. And they said, we're going to, and they let everyone know why they were doing this. Mm -hmm. It was one of the most healthiest things that I saw. And then when their counselor said, okay, now you're ready to go back, they stepped back into ministry. Yeah. Never missed a beat. Yeah. And I and I've I've told him since I said I, I have such respect for, because I've seen it the other way where people are having problems, they just keep it quiet. It's going on, but then it it starts to affect everything. And then I've seen you know churches close or somebody commits adultery you know, and all this stuff was going on. So I, I think what you said is very wise. It, it, there's nuances to it, um, but people need to be aware. I used to tell people, it's like, are you, is what you're going through, is it affecting other people now? Right, yes. You know, does it have a, a, a negative effect upon the other mm -hmm. people? Mm -hmm. So we need yeah. to be aware of that. Being aware of that, oh. yeah. Yeah, okay, last question. And this is what I wanted to look at. Um, let see, do we have any, let me check online. Okay, no questions on Facebook yet. What tools, I want to talk about tools now because I'm a, I'm a big tools guy. Strategies. <laughs> so what tools are available to individuals that they can use to support and nurture their own mental and emotional health? Mm -hmm. What would you recommend? Yeah. Um, it depends what your needs are and what your interests are. Like if you really want to geek out about really understanding emotions, Dr. Feldman's book, uh, Dr. Feldman Barrett's book, How Emotions Are Made is excellent. Uh, her colleague, Bacha Mesquita, her book, Between Us, How Cultures Shape Emotion, I referenced a lot of her ideas through this, this interview, uh, is also, a, it's a wonderful read, and you can learn a lot about your emotions and how emotions work in the brain and body and culture. So if you really want to get into the, the science of this, read some books. If you're just like, okay, I, I get your basic idea, emotions are meaning that we make from our sensations, but I want to learn how to cope with my emotions, I think the first step is getting comfortable with noticing your body. Mm. A lot of people disembody themselves. So kind of returning to your body, reconnecting your mind and body and noticing what am I feeling in my body and what emotion might, might I construct from these sensations? What is going on here? And can I be more specific with the emotions I'm constructing? There are a bunch of different ways you can do that. Here I can show you the little otter emotion cards. Hmm. They're designed for kids, but I've also used them with college students. Uh, I think they're good for any age and they're watercolor illustrations of animals. So we've got like a worried whale. They're really beautiful. The anxious butterfly and they're color coded, mm -hmm. um, for kind of the different uh, are these comfortable emotions or uncomfortable emotions? It gives a little definition of the emotion. And then it, it gives some questions on the back to guide you through when have I felt this before? How am I experiencing it in my body? How can I reach out to my caregivers for support when I'm feeling this wonderful tool for introducing kids to just emotional granularity. Okay. And you said you also used it with college students. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I was in a class called God and emotions hmm. this, uh, the semester and I passed those cards around and the undergrads loved it. They, they just wow. had a lot of fun with that. I'm going to see if I can, there's a, there's an app I want to show you. 
see if my phone will find it. And then I have this journal, The Untangle Workbook by Mark Allen Shelsky. He also wrote a book called The Wisdom of Your Heart, which yeah. is, it is not an academic book. It is written for everyday Christians. It's a wonderful book about our emotions and how emotions are part of our spiritual health. Great book, highly recommend his book. But then this workbook is a really good companion and it takes you through an emotion experience and it's several pages for each emotion. So as you begin the journal, you um, say, okay, I was, I got really, I was really afraid today when something happened at work. So you start to, to write it through and you go through this whole process of really examining the emotion and it helps you work through step-by-step. Step. How is an emotion constructed? What are the beliefs that led to it? What are the situations? Why did I construct this particular emotion? What steps did I want to take afterward? What action did I take? And so the more you do that in detail, which is a lot of work, the quicker you'll do it in the future. And so it's a good starting tool. Mm -hmm. I think eventually once you did went through this whole workbook, by the end of it, you'd be like, okay, now when I'm having a big emotion, I can really quickly work through it in my mind, kind of following some right. of those same steps. So that's a good tool. And then get this app open. There's an app called how we feel that I've started using recently. And it lets you track your emotions several times through day. So like I can do an emotion check-in. How are you feeling this afternoon? I'm going to check in. Now, this is an affective circumplex, which is a scale. And up and down is arousal or activation. Like how intense is this emotion? How activated mm -hmm. is my body? And then valence, how comfortable versus uncomfortable is it? And so you chart your emotions on the graph. So this is basically a, a color-coded affective circumplex. So right now I'm feeling high energy and really pleasant. So I'm going to click that and it pops open a bunch of different emotions. I am feeling, let's see, I'm enthusiastic. I'm upbeat. I'm eager. I'm energized. I'm not, I'm not at the level of like exhilarated or thrilled, like super high arousal. Um, I'm feeling, yeah, let's go with enthusiastic. So it okay. gives me, you know, I chose this. I can write a little description. I can add a photo. I can add a voice note to track the emotion. Then once I save it, it lets me analyze. And now I haven't been doing it the last few days, so it's only showing today's, but it starts to show what emotions you've been feeling over time. And if I go back to like back in March, I was really stressed and I was, I was, I had some blue emotions okay. and then it actually will show you a calendar if you do it enough and it'll show you every day, what emotion you were feeling. So that's a wonderful tool to get used to paying attention to your body, naming your emotions and analyzing them. That's just a fun app and it's free. So, yeah. and it gives you a way to track it. Yeah. To track what you've been feeling over time. And for those of you that are in the zoom room, Karen put the, I believe she put the um, links for that. Karen, if you could also put that on Facebook or, we'll, or if you're on Facebook and you're watching this, if we don't get it before we're, it's over, we'll put it in there uh, afterwards. So those are, that, that app reminds me of, you, you know, um, Mark, uh, yeah, Mark Brackett, Permission to Feel. Have you, he did a, he did a app mood meter. Have you seen? I haven't. No, I have that book, but I haven't read it yet. Yeah. And he talks about it in the book. Um, and I used to show that to people. It's basically the same idea. You can look at how you feel. You look at different emotions and you tap on it. And then it'll say, you know, if you're feeling this, um, if you're, are you at work or are you at home? Mm -hmm. and, and then it helps you to track it over time. And I've recommended that, but mm -hmm. I like the one that you showed also very, very similar. Um, so those are some really good tools. I know something else that you are interested in, uh, which really surprised me when I heard you talk about it was internal family systems, mm -hmm. IFS. You want to mention and talk about that a, a bit? And we yeah, had talked sure. about doing something. So if you want to do that, we can do that. Yeah. So IFS, um, it stems from the older therapeutic model of family systems, which is to say people don't have problems as individuals. They have problems as part of a family. And we need to look at their family relationships and how the, those relationships interplay to help them heal. So Richard Schwartz developed internal family systems after he was trained in the original family systems model. Um, because he realized when he was working with clients, they would say things like a part of me feels like this. And a part of me feels like this. 
I think all of us do that. Even if it's just like, well, part of me feels like getting vanilla ice cream. The other part of me feels like getting chocolate ice cream. But he used that idea of family systems to look at our minds as having these multiple parts, not like multiple personality disorder, just as a way of visualizing those conversations we have with ourselves. Um, And so the IFS model gives you kind of scripts and approaches for having more productive conversations with yourself to find those wounded exiled parts. Like I talked about earlier to deal with those manager parts that come up to try to protect us and keep us safe, but sometimes have maladaptive behaviors. The idea is that no parts are bad. They're all trying to help us. It's this family system inside of us that all wants to work together, but those parts kind of get in conflict. We feel internal uh, polarization. But the idea is that once we're in self-control, when the part of us that's not a part, like the real, what Alison Cook calls the spirit-led self, that self needs to be the healthy parent in charge of all the other parts and bring them into self-control. And it's like the most practical way I've ever heard self-control talked about. Mm. And it's a method for actually getting there. It has radically changed my life as a client Mm. so much so that I'm now in a 16 week IFS training class over the summer so that I can incorporate this into the pastoral care work that I do. Um, It's it's just so powerful. So if you want to do an example, Mike, I can walk you through that. Okay. Okay. So obviously this is in front of people. This is not a confidential session. So this is going to be working with a part of you that you don't mind sharing with people. I know you're very open and vulnerable, but just be aware of, of that. And we can stop anytime if you're uncomfortable, but as you come into this conversation, if you look inside and you kind of listen to yourself, what are some parts of you that would like your attention today? Um, making sure that I get rest over the weekend. Mm. So you have a part that's worried that you're not going to rest, or it's, it's just concerned that you get yeah, rest. It has a goal I get for rest. you. Right. Okay. okay. So as you think about that part of you, where are you feeling that in your body or around your body? Mostly here in the center of my chest. Mm -hmm. As you focus on that part of you, that's concerned that you get enough rest. How is it coming to you? Like, what are you noticing about it? Um, I mean, what am I sensing or what are you sensing from this, this part? (laughs) What, what kind of comes up is most make sure you get some rest. <laughs> make sure you get some rest. So it's got a make really sure clear you, message. Yeah. 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 Does it feel like it's really kind of blended with your body or is it separate enough that you can have a conversation with this part of you? Um, yeah, it's separate enough. Okay. So as you look at this part, is there anything you notice? Is it, does it have a sound or a color or a shape? Is it appearing as anything, or is it just kind of a sense of this voice that's talking to you? It's more of a sense of a voice Okay. that's centered in my chest area, Okay. like right around here. Yeah. So ask this part, what does it do for you? What is its role in your life? To make sure that you do, you do rest, mm-hmm. especially if there's been a, a, a long week of training, to mm-hmm. make sure that you're that you're taking time off to recoup to recuperate to enjoy yourself. Because mm-hmm. so it's, it, it's like because it's like it's like because it's so easy for you to jump to the next thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Is it is that coming in a critical way or is it just kind of making observations for you? Just um, no, it's it's soft. It's kind of making an observation. It, it's 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 not anything that I'm going. No no no. It's like. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it's soft and Uh gentle. Okay. So how do you feel toward that part? Good. Good. It it feels like a, a friend. It's like a, it's a gentle, it's a gentle reminder. Mm. That's why I could put it. That's great. Can you let that part know that you really appreciate what it does for you? Send some gratitude to it. Mm -hmm. How does it respond to that? Is 
is interesting. It, it, it's like it's it's almost like um, for lack of a better way, it's like it's it's like okay, buddy. <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. okay, just wanted to remind you. Yeah. We had yeah. a long week of training, so okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. It's almost like thank you for paying attention. Right. Yeah. So it can yeah. appreciate your gratitude, and it's glad that you're kind of finally paying attention. Yeah. yeah. Does this part ever get frustrated with you, or feel like you're not paying attention? Sometimes. Okay. Yeah. Does it have any fears or concerns for you or about you or about anything in your life? I, I wouldn't say it's so much a fear, maybe a, a, a gentle concern is like, Hey, we're getting older. We can't do what we used to do when we were younger, mm -hmm. staying up late. And so we have to make sure that we are taking care of ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. So kind of, it's like, it, it is a health monitor. Yeah. Okay. So it's like, make sure you get enough sleep, make sure, yeah. make sure you have fun, that you're doing things that you enjoy. Mm -hmm. How old does this part think you are? The age that I am now. Okay. 58. So this is, it sounds yeah. like a part, this is a part you're pretty well connected with. It's aware mm -hmm. that you're an adult. Sometimes people will have these manager parts that think they're still children or teenagers mm -hmm. and it's important to update them. But this sounds like a part you're already pretty well acquainted it, with. It, it, yeah. Cause it feels more like an ally. Great. It's like, in, in, in the, the sense again, is like, I'm your ally to, to, awesome. to, to kind of go, Hey, you know, cause I just literally came off of five days of training. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's like, Okay, and we're getting ready to go next week into, I got two more days of training. So it's like, yeah. make sure you rest in between. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can you ask this part, is it aware of any wounded or hurting or damaged parts of yourself that it protects that it might want you to be aware of? The sense that I'm getting it is, no, we're good. Great. We're good. Yeah, good. And how are you? How are you feeling toward this part now that you've gotten to know it a little bit better? Actually, very good. Okay. Very good. Because, like I said, it really feels like, yeah, this is this is definitely my ally. That's awesome. <laughs> And that's what all of our manager parts should become in, in our healthy system. Yeah. They're, they're really important allies and yeah. they really help us. So what do you want to do to reassure this part that you hear what it said and what commitments do you want to make? Like, yes, here's what I'm going to do to, to rest. I I'm hearing what you're saying. I'm going to implement it. So say that to the part or. Yeah. Yeah. Let the part know. Like I hear what you're okay. saying. Here's okay. my plan. Okay. Yeah. That feels good. Okay. Does it, it's, it's cool. It feels like message delivered. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's the things that I like to do to relax. So it's like, um, I can, I can tell you if you, it was, it's like, yeah. you know, if, if, so my wife was working on her master's, but like, if she has time to go sit and watch a movie together, um, I like comic books. So read a comic book, mm -hmm. take a nap. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, yeah, that's what you need to do to, to renew and, and also do some, some light reading, because I often do a lot of heavy reading, but some mm -hmm. light reading that I enjoy rather Great. than just always academic, scholarly, but things that I enjoy. That's good. So now that you've heard that warning that was coming up, how does that sensation in your chest feel? Good. It's, 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 it's like, there's a sense of okayness, like good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're, you're hearing me. Good. That's great. Yeah. How was that for you to check in with that part? Did that, that was, good? yeah, that was nice. <laughs> it was, it was a nice reminder. It's like, yeah, I do. I do need to take a break this week. Yeah. yeah that's great. Cool. Yeah. Well, thanks for being that's willing cool. to share that with us. I appreciate it. Thank that. you. That is nice. That is yeah. nice. And Oh, <laughs> I'm looking over at the, cause one of the questions that came, or one of the things that came when you said, uh, how, how, 
how old is this part? Thank you. Or my, I think my wife wrote old. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> One of the questions that did come up, which I wanted to ask, because I've heard you in other broad, uh, podcasts talk about this. What are your thoughts regarding mindfulness, and especially mindfulness practices for mm-hmm. Christians? Mm-hmm. I know that some Christians get really uncomfortable with the idea, especially the word mindfulness, mm-hmm. because they associate it maybe with Buddhism or with, you know, um, Eastern religions in general, um, and are concerned that it would be a spiritually impacted kind of, that, that it would be bad for them spiritually. So they're mm-hmm. afraid of it. This idea that it might be kind of a pagan practice that would not be healthy for them as Christians. But if you think of mindfulness as an intentional awareness of your body and your situation in the world, it's, I think it's a very neutral, neutral to healthy practice. Mm-hmm. Like I don't think that it carries bad spiritual weight with it and it, mm-hmm. it can be very helpful. And I think we see, um, we see mindfulness ideas in scripture. You see it in the Psalms. <clears throat> oh, my soul, why are you so downcast within me? Mm-hmm. Right? Like a turning inward, a mindfulness that we're carrying heavy emotions, a mindfulness mm-hmm. that something is wrong, a connection with our body. Like I lie in my bed all night and weep tears. Like the psalmists, right? Um, that's a it's a mindfulness. It's it's connecting to our body, our bodily experience, and our emotions. So these kind of like just noticing our bodies is a really important part of emotional health. And especially if you're carrying trauma, it can ground you when you start to dissociate or have a panic attack. So even just a simple practice like noticing, okay, I am. I'm, I'm in my office, I'm in my own home and I'm safe here. Mm -hmm. My feet are on the floor and I'm rooted to the ground. I'm connected to the earth. I'm not dissociated. I'm not floating in space, but I'm connected to God's creation. I'm sitting in a chair that's supporting my weight. I'm noticing the warmth of my own hands on my thighs I'm aware of the oxygen going in and out of my body. And then if you, if you need to ground yourself further, looking around the room, okay, I'm looking for something red. I see the red robe on the Jesus statue that I have over here. And I see a red book on my shelf. Can we look for something green? I see the green background in the painting of my cat. I see the green plant on the wall and noticing those details with our senses can really help bring us out of a dissociative state or can help calm us if we're feeling panicked or feeling some anxiety. Um, And then if I want to turn that mindfulness to my emotions and just think, okay, what emotions are coming up for me or what sensations am I feeling in my body right now? My body feels really neutral. It feels loose. It feels relaxed. Feeling a little bit of tightness in my chest, but I think that's heartburn not, uh, not necessarily like an emotion sensation. I'm feeling very peaceful. I would say like the emotion that I'm constructing right now is peace. So that like, that's what I would mean by mindfulness. It's being aware of my body. And once I'm aware of my body and my surroundings, it's turning to look at my emotions. Um, and it, it, because our emotions are so connected to our bodily sensations, It is very hard to articulate our emotions if we are disconnected from our bodies. Does that answer the question? I think it does. Yeah, I think that was a great answer. Uh, And I just want to add, and I think sometimes when Christians look at this and because they know it's been associated with another religion, they go, oh, no, this is, but it's like mindfulness has been studied scientifically. And there's been a lot of studies. And so you can separate out the religious spiritual component and just look at the actual what's the actual science behind it and it and it's i look upon it as it's an ability that we all have now you can add spiritual and other beliefs to it but it's an ability to become aware in the moment become aware of your body that's a, that's something that god equipped us all with and this and the science says it it, it can be very very helpful to mm-hmm. to learn that skill and to practice that skill Yeah. And scripture talks about meditating on God's word day and night. Meditation is not something we need to be afraid of. Right. It's 
what are we meditating on? And so right. mindfulness and meditation, like I am mindful when I sit here and I think on scripture, like if I practice Lectio Divina, I go over a scripture passage over and over again, and I let the Holy Spirit speak to me through it. I notice new things each time I go through the passage, or if I do breath prayers and I breathe in and pray and I breathe out and pray mm -hmm. just short phrases like Lord Jesus Christ, I trust in you. Mm -hmm. Those are, those are mindful meditative practices that are right. very well supported in scripture and Christian tradition. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much. You know, and I, I think that, you know, again, to, to kind of wrap this up now, first of all, thank you so much for walking so that, you know, it, when you were talking, I was still feeling that I'll go like, there's that part of me still going, okay, so we are going to go rest. Like, yes, it's, it's like a really kind of focus, like, okay, we yeah. are going to do this. So that was it's like, it kind of spread Mm -hmm. more in a, in a, in a nice way, not in a negative way, but in a very nice way. So I was like, Oh, that's cool. Well, an important um, thing to keep in mind is when you make a commitment to a part of yourself, you have to keep it in yeah. order to be trustworthy to yourself. So you definitely yeah. have to go rest. now. Well, well, and the, and the, it was like, it was, there was a sense of, we are going to do this. That's what yeah. it was spreading. Um, like, I was yeah. like, Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Um, it would, the other thing I just wanted to say was that, that for a long time, I think, uh, believers, I know when I first got into this again, almost 30, over 30 years ago, Karen and I, and we started looking at different tools and it was, it was slow going at first because we were taught, the only tools you have was prayer, study, <laughs> that's it. And then we start learning other things, but it's like to recognize that God in his wisdom, just like we think of doctors, surgeons, that God, he does provide. So going back to a conversation that we had earlier, Christ is sufficient and in his sufficiency, he provides us with all of these wonderful tools to help us to flourish, to help us to, to, to really live good, healthy lives. Would, yeah. would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, here's my question uh, in closing. Where can people reach you if they want to know more about what you're doing? Um, and if they want to reach out to you, how can they do that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my website is beckycastlemiller.com and I've got a contact form on there. So if you would like me to be on your podcast, you can contact me through that or invite me to preach at your church or... Um, I also have a few spots open this summer to do kind of some emotion coaching using mm -hmm. an IFS framework. So if people are interested in booking some sessions, I have some availability. Um, I am on Substack at beckycastlemiller.substack.com. I write three times a week about emotions in the church, sharing some of my academic research, as well as just really practical things on emotion that we can put into, uh, into our lives. And then I'm on um, Instagram and TikTok um, with not every day, but I try to post a reel a day, a short minute and a half videos on little tips for emotional health. Okay. Well, I'll, if you can send to me all of your contact information, Absolutely. we will make sure. sure that we put it here in the, uh, in the, the um, comment section and underneath the uh, advertisement so people can get in contact with you. It has been a joy and a pleasure. Like I said, you are my sister from another mister. <laughs> it's been such a joy and pleasure to have you on here and to talk about this, this is so important. I love to see someone else who has the same passion. I, I've said for years, I say emotions have gotten a bad rap within the body of Christ. And I see part of my purpose in life is to change that. And it seems like you have that same passion to get people to look upon their emotions as their allies and not as their enemy and, their, and that they're God given. So thank you so much for being on. One of the things I do want to say to you, because I, I listened to your, uh, your podcast last night with the Marcella Project. Mm -hmm. listening to it and I you said something and be, I, I'm currently doing a series dealing with uh women and men and the whole egalitarian complementarian uh -huh. thing uh -huh. I would love to have you back sometime and talk about the impact that I want to say this nicely as I can that complementarian theology has upon the emotions of women and the impact that it has upon them in ministry I think we also have to talk about the impact it has on the emotions of men and the emotions of men, yeah. yeah. Because I, 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 when you, when I heard you last night, I was thinking, that's something we didn't have a plan for this, but that's something I would love in the future for us to come yeah. back and talk about. I've been a part of some groups, and I've, and I've, and I've had people when I, as I've been doing this series, contact me privately and say, mm -hmm. thank you so much for this series, and they share with me their experiences and the trauma that yeah. they've experienced. So I thought it would be good to talk about that and to talk about how they can heal from that. 
Absolutely. That would be great. I would love to do that. This was really fun. Okay. Thank you for having yeah. me. Thank you so much again, and I appreciate it. Thank you all. We will be uploading this to our uh, YouTube channel, KIC TV, keeping it in context. And uh, we'll be back here next week. We'll be talking more about flexible faith and nurturing good mental and emotional health. Uh, in the weeks to come, one of the people I'm going to be interviewing, I just confirmed it today, is my wife, Karen. We're going to be talking with her about her journey and how she is healed and how God has caused her to flourish uh, mentally and emotionally. So that's coming in the future. I just want to say again, thank you so much, Becky. This was a joy and a pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. All right. We'll see everybody next week. Bye-bye.